You're listening to The Adventuring Party, talking about gaming the Irish way. Well, folks, it's uh, your host, Savage, here. We're back this week for another Bits Box. I've gathered up another couple of lumps of strange and wonderful stuff that sometimes only broadly related to gaming and the hobby, but I thought I'd stick them together into a, a custom piece. You know, before we know it, we've got an episode. So, this first piece, uh, I grabbed our own sage, Sean, and uh, sat him down to have a little talk about uh, the recent, recent-ish, last year. Well, the D&D Essentials Box, a, uh, a launch pad for a new group, or new players, or even a, a new GM who just wants to try out the, the great game for the first time. So, let's get right into it. Well, Sean. Hello. How are you? Oh, it's been a while. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's been busy uh, here in lockdown. Uh, I know we're all we're all busy all the time doing all of our things. Yeah. Sean, you're uh, you're. I mean, most listeners don't need any introduction, do they? You were you've been here since the, uh, the mountains were were raised up and the forests were first planted. Uh, not, not not as long as some, but yeah, no, I've, I've been at this a few years. Uh, less less so recently. Uh, so, what are two old sort of craggy beasts like us doing here what are we discussing today uh, what i've brought uh for those who are interested is the release last year the dungeons and dragons essentials kit that i hold up to an invisible camera uh, in the case any listeners can see me uh, which is the i would say the second starter kit released for dungeons and dragons fifth edition and really kind of complements the original uh, in interesting ways um but uh, yeah, no, it, it released last year, uh, and I, I picked it up. Um, and lockdown uh, made me um, increase the number of games I was running. So uh, suddenly, uh, rather than DMing two tables, I was DMing four tables, and uh, that gave me an opportunity to run it um, uh, end to end uh, and see. Give me a moment while I pull my eyebrows back down <laughs> somewhere <laughs> under my hairline. You, you, you got to keep busy. You, you got to keep busy. bloody hell. <laughs> Four gets quote. So it's fair to say that you've started a fair few bands of murder hobos on their travels. Absolutely. So what what uh, what kind of prompted you to use a starter kit, which presumably you have no use for? You've got all your old tricks ready, and you, all your old you've got a GM screen that's probably encrusted with the blood of a thousand adventures. Oh yeah. So what? What promoted you to pick up this? So I often find myself starting new tables with new players, uh, people who have no experience. Um, maybe, maybe that's just because I'm a glutton for punishment. But uh, it, it's in, in, in this particular case, it was um, a bunch of players who were curious about Dungeons & Dragons, got themselves together and came to me and said, hey, we're not going outside anymore. Uh, so in lieu of being social, maybe you could run us some Dungeons & Dragons. Um, and when it comes to new players, I found that I because I I'd, I'd had a little read through the Essentials Adventure and I'd done the Starter Adventure a few times. But I find that the start the the fifth edition starter boxes are just well structured for new players. They kind of they they teach each each little bit of it teaches a lesson to the players as they play. And um, the starter box particularly might me they're you know it, while in theory they're good for starter DMs, I find that. A more experienced DM can let them run smoother. Uh, I know fellow host Owen has uh, horror stories about how the opening of uh, of, the, of the, the fifth edition starter set um, it went for went for his character. Um, Is that Minds of Fandalver or something? Yeah, yeah, Minds of Fandalver. Yeah. Uh, if if yeah. the, the, the the early couple <laughs> of encounters can be very very lethal if they're not uh, handled deftly. But, uh, okay, well, let's just quickly break down what's in the box set. Okay. It's, 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 first of all, it's a good old hefty box oh, yeah. set, it's which everybody loves. A pr- proper box. Uh, so when you crack it open, when you crack what do you get? You actually get a bunch of stuff in it, like far more than in uh, the, the previous one. So you get you get a, you get a rule book, uh, which is the basic rules, which are available free online, uh, which is enough for playing the game, uh, casting spells, and making characters if you're happy using the limited set of classes and races included. 
Um, you guessed the adventure, uh, the Dragon of Ice Fire Peak, which I think is the real uh, most the real value in the box. Uh, put that to one side because that's what we'll be talking about the most here. Uh, you get a map of the the local area, a hex map uh, for players to crawl over. That handily is not marked with any DM important information, so you can just hand it out to the players and let them have at it. The flip side also has a town map that they'll be referring to a lot. It gives a nice uh, flimsy cardboard Dungeon Master screen with some good art on the back and uh, on the inside has everything a new or uh, a new DM might need. Just uh, just references for all of the maybe lesser known or occasionally looked up rules. Um, it, it's, a, it's a good DM screen. It's not, not naff. Uh, you get blank character sheets because unlike the Lost Minds of Endelver, this... Um, this particular game encourages players to make their own characters. Um, you get a set of dice, and it's not just a straight poly set. You get have your 4d6 and 2d20, which is really what you need from D&D, because that lets you roll characters and do advantage and disadvantage rolls together. Um, and a couple of cool things it gives you that, that are just sort of nice extras. One gives you codes for the adventure and a couple of sequel adventures on D&D Beyond. I'll get into those in a bit. Um, and also cards. It gives you loads of cards. So it gives you like a bunch of flash cards for characters uh, intended to be sidekicks, which is something I'll get into in a minute. Um, and also just um, cards for all the magic items that appear in the adventure, uh, all the condi- every condition in the game, and um, little flash cards that uh, teach players how to um, do combat, like like quick references. So, um, if, you know, for, for new players, if, if you get, get a magic item, you can hand them a card with it all written on it. If they meet a character, you can hand them that. If they get a condition, you can just hand them the condition card. Just Lots of things that would be helpful for a new a new dungeon master, um, and new players even. There's also a little cardboard box to put it all in, which is uh, just nice. A neat little inclusion, yeah. I'm I'm looking at a, a screenshot of of some of the stuff. I hadn't realised that the region map was hexed. Yeah, it is. Um, it is a hex which map. is like that's that's an excellent. It's something that I think a lot of gamers sometimes shy away from is the old hex crawl, mm-hmm. but. Presumably, this encourages the, the GM and the players to kind of ex- explore the surrounding region. Yeah, there, there's and, uh, there's a bit of exploring involved. Um, it's yeah, it's it's kind of it's it's left it's left optional. So the DM knows where the players are going. They could just say you get there in in two days and you know plot the rest overnight, or you can do your right. You've entered a hex. Roll your roll your navigation, and it, it gives guidelines for how to handle boat, uh, how to handle players getting lost in a hex, and. Uh, um, huh. Coming out the other end. Excellent. Uh, of course, if very useful stuff to have. Yeah. Uh, and I have to say, like, I love the cards. Oh. Everything about the cards is just they're, bang on. They're, the they're very condition good. cards. Yeah. The, the quick, the quick rules reference. The magic item stuff on hand. Just hand it over, and that player is now going to pour over their details mm. of their new toy while uh, while you find out what the barbarian is going to do. Uh, and uh, yeah, I know it's not probably the the heaviest card stock. But I love the art on the DM screen. Uh, it's just this band of adventures setting out. Oh yeah, it's 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 and, it's, it's, it's got a, it's got a big double fold, and it's got the yeah, adventure setting out an adventure on one side, and it's got an ambush lying in wait on the other. Uh, I love it. I love the dwarf pulling the cart as well. It's like, <laughs> we uh, we can't afford you just yet. We're just starting out. <laughs> well, you, you, you um, get the strong person to carry everything. It's fine. Okay, so you. Th- the primary reason we're talking about this course mm. is because you've had the opportunity now to run some players through it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, the adventure itself, what can you tell us? So, I really like to structure the adventure. Um, uh, now, this this is kind of an old-fashioned structure, but uh, it, it was new to me. Uh, I've only been gaming maybe 15 years. Uh, so... Uh, it's it's basically um, it's set around the same town as the starter kit adventure, and the idea with that is that you can simply take this adventure and ch- put it inside the original starter adventure and make a much lengthier campaign. Though the stories don't really um, interact. Uh, how how this works is you're basically a band of adventurers have walked into town looking for work, and on the notice board are uh, three postings of jobs. Um, and you take those jobs and you do them, uh, you get rewards, and when you do a couple of them, then you find that there's more postings of jobs on the board, and oh, maybe we can do those too. And if your players spend some time talking to local townsfolk, they might hear some rumours of some other jobs, and maybe some interesting ruins that they can go and take a poke about in, uh, as well as well as what's written up on the job board. So 
it, in that sense, it's a very sort of open-ended player-driven adventure. Um, you you just present players with uh, you know three offers of work and maybe two rumors, and leave it up to them to decide what they're going to do. Uh, the actual layout of the book um, is literally just uh, every two three pages. It's just the title of a location and just the detail of uh, of what will happen in that location, what job will direct the players there, what what uh, they find there, how they'll get there, and if there's a little bit of a dungeon, then um, a dun- a small dungeon map and a brief overview of you know what's in each room and what the people or creatures there are up to and ha- what they're like, how they think, how they feel, um, which makes each each little adventure takes like most of them are two pages long. Uh, which is and I'll just hold one up for the camera where players can't see. It's like a page of description of the adventure, a little map of the surroundings, and another half page of further description of like um, stats. There's also stats for all the included monsters uh, in the back of the book, which is which is useful. Um, and that looks that looks like a nicely detailed map as well. It's a half page and it's oh yeah yeah it's, it's got all it's, it's it's a proper uh, pro- proper little dungeon map. A circle of stones mm-hmm. or something. Yeah, that's a circle of stones. Uh, it's got it's proper keyed. It's gridded. Um, you can't hand it out to players obviously because there's little secret doors and traps marked on it. But it's 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 not it's it's not 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 so not a, a user. I've only only one of the maps I, I came across in this uh, I recognized as a reused map for a previous adventure. But uh, everything else is. Uh, I think new for this, and and as I said, everything is only two to four pages long. They're all very bite sized, very small. Most of them will be knocked out in a single session. Um, so it's it's for especially for new players, it gives them like a real sense of achievement as they go through it. Um, Episodes being kind of wrapped up, yeah. in, in one go. So would I be right in saying that the the inclusion of maps like that in the book ties into its Digital footprint. Yes, uh, there's, there's uh, f- when they, they they included code for D and D Beyond, and this is actually a unique thing. Um, some something people want in more products, but I don't think you'll get it because D and D Beyond are a separate company. But uh, mm. the, the inclusion of it it gives the whole adventure on D and D Beyond, uh, including digital versions of the maps and player versions of the maps. But I found the problem with player versions of maps on D&D Beyond is they'll take out the secret doors, but they won't take out the secret room behind the secret doors, so if you show the map to the player, they're still going to... They're, 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 they're going to be suspicious. You might have to start in on some masking and things, yeah. and whatever your, your tabletop uh, suite of choices. Mm. Right. Uh, so, how does it how does it wind up? Do you fight a dragon? Yeah, or, uh, you you fight a dragon without any spoilers. Without, without, without any spoilers. So the, <laughs> the intro to the intro to this adventure, and as it, it's pretty story light, so partially so it can fit in easy to the starter adventure, which is pretty story heavy. Um, this intro to this adventure is there is a dragon has just moved into the region. It's carrying cows away. Uh, the, every time players arrive or leave a location, you roll a dice to see where the dragon is at that time. And uh, if that dragon coincides with the players, then, um, you know, the, an encounter ah. ensues. Uh, I think two sessions in, um, for my party, uh, the dragon appeared before them. So uh, they decided they'll all huddle together under a fog cloud. So the dragon swooped in, grabbed one of them and flew away with his lunch. Um, you know, that, <laughs> that comes easy. Uh, I picked the character that I felt the player was mature enough to handle his uh, new character <laughs> oh, being snatched away. Oh, so we had a, an, an early bath for that player. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Then, uh, I had a re-roll, buddy. I, I, D&D. They, 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 they could, I felt they could take it. Uh, and and they, they did. <laughs> um, the other players were discussing how they would hate, hate it for it to happen to them, but he took it in a stride. Uh, the, Stuff. The, the, the structure, like I said, they're, just, they're more, mostly independent adventures, but there is a, a story unfolds from them. Uh, the obvi- often the, it, the while the adventures can stand alone, you can take them on up by themselves. There, there, there is like a sort of connectivity to them. The dragon arrived in one area, displacing the the creatures that were already there. They found a new home in a different area, displacing the creatures who were already there, who found mm-hmm. a new home, in a different area, and that all that. That, that domino effect has caused problems the whole way down the line, which leads to a number of the adventures. Uh, there's also another um, there's another force operating in the background that uh, doesn't really play a huge part in this adventure, but is mainly there to establish them. So if, if players get to the end and decide they want more, as I said, there is a set of there's a set of three short uh, continuations of this that you get on the. 
is three short continuations that you get okay. on, on the indie bound when you when you when you scan the codes, and they um, the 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 sort of the minor antagonists in this come to the fore in those. So if if players get to the end of this and decide they they're hungry for more, there's an easy option to continue on to. If players don't want to buy, if a DM doesn't want to buy like an additional adventure, also includes advice on how to transition to the other official published adventures as they always do um but yeah it, it's player players explore the countryside uh, gradually they figure out where the dragon lives and when they feel good and ready they walk up to the dragon's front door and and uh give them a good talking to um, so. i have to say it is it's a product without pretense it's, yeah. it has a really clean old school kind of easy entry feel to it that i'm i'm kind of Looking at it, I'm going, man. Can I can I find four fresh young faces <laughs> to uh, to run through this just to relive some of those glory days? So so th- um, so that's 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 a good point about this this box that I kind of left out. Mm. Um, they included in this box was the beta rules of of something that's being added in more fully in a forthcoming D and D rules expansion uh, called Do tell. Sidekicks, which is very simple um, and really and you need uh, thankfully gives you the D&D Beyond plugin because they only publish part of the rules here and the rest are in the free D&D Beyond extension but basically it's uh, they give you three simple classes uh, that are a little bit more basic than a normal player class the expert the spellcaster and the warrior uh, who each have uh, a weapon a couple of saves uh, and one ability and uh and just advice for how how they might advance as they go up levels. And the the idea is that if you do not have a full table of players, you add a couple of sidekicks to the party. Um, flesh them out with full characters, but they have they they've, they've got very simple stat sheets and uh, give one to one of your players or two to a player, and suddenly they have a full party. Um, it's even if if the rest of the party are not being played, not real people, and maybe not as impressive as an actual. Uh, full, right. fully statted player character, uh, but but they're player run auxiliaries. They're pl- so player not run on an extra weight. Yeah, very, very, very light. Um, like one, one or one or two abilities each, and their abilities tend more towards supportive. Even the warrior's ability is about defending their companions. Uh, yeah, uh, I didn't. They're not going to over. They're not going to overshadow the the stars of the show. E- exactly, uh, which was very much the intent. I didn't get a chance to. I read through them fully because I happened upon a full pl- table of five, uh, <laughs> so I didn't find a need for them. The the balance. The, the every every encounter in it uh, is just saying like in this room you will find let's say for example goblins. Add in this many goblins. De- add in a number of goblins depending on how many players are in the room. So if your party is one heroic adventurer 10 year old and their one sidekick then they're not going to be overwhelmed by monsters uh, right that's uh, so that's new players would you say there's anything here for an established group that are say you know they're they're rounding in on on level 10 or 11 mm. and the gm has run them through plenty of stuff it's got a sandbox element though and they decide to just head for the coast one day just for a bit <laughs> of a trip out to see what they find is there anything here that could be adapted or how hard would you say it is to take this material and bring it to a game that's kind of in its in its stride so the the adventures are all kind of self-contained so they're in one sense they're very easily adapted as written they're low level encounters so a uh, dm would need to basically respect the whole thing to suit their party and certainly a, when, once a party hits a certain point i'm thinking level 11 12 that might start to feel uh, a, a couple of the adventures uh, a couple of the adventure selves might start to feel trivial um mm. but it's it's absolutely doable um because as at their at their core they are very simple encounters one session in and out one and done uh so there, there, there is some meat here if a DM is willing to, uh, you know, uh, add in some extra stronger foes uh, and maybe maybe rethink a couple of the traps to actually prove a challenge to uh, more established adventures. Okay, but uh, still lots of lots of goodies in the box. Oh, lots of things I think any GM would find useful, especially things like stat cards mm-hmm. or, or condition cards. Um, and as you say, an interesting digital kind of footprint that 
spans off from the yeah the main game. I've, I've I've had a look. I haven't run the expansions. I've started running one of them. Uh, I haven't, and it's they're they're by different writers, and I feel a little less well balanced. Uh, but they 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 do continue on the adventure to level eleven. Once the the first book is really all about the dragon, but the the tone it sets, the the foes it introduces, they all come into the fore if a player chooses to play the expansion adventures, which are yeah, I, I I'm I'm so far I'm less keen on them. Um they're they're I'm running through them all right, but whereas whereas all the adventures in this one tend to really fit neatly into a session or two sessions, I'm three sessions deep in uh, in combat into uh the second encounter of, of, a, oh of, of an adventure. Um so they're they're they, they might require a little bit more work uh for a DM to, to get going. They're, they're obviously weren't published in the book, so they must not have met the fine uh, playtesting standards that Wizards normally puts their their encounters through. Uh, but this does seem to be a very finely tuned product to, as you said, to, to get new GMs and players mm. into a pattern of play that is comfortable, mm. and then you can kind of expand out from there. Absolutely. Well, that's probably all we've time for now. Uh, what did you pay for it? What could people expect to, to put down for this product? Oh, it's, it's been a year. My gut says I spent about twenty five euro on it. Uh, certainly, it, it was priced in or around the same price as the starter set, which I think tends to be in somewhere in the twenty five thirty euro mark. Um, I, that checks out. They're listed here on the site for twenty four dollars ninety nine. So presumably we've got yeah, off, off, something similar. Often imports you just knock off the dollar sign and write scribble in a <laughs> wee euro symbol on top. Uh, that keeps things simple. Yeah. Um, okay, so double sided map, mm. rule book, mm. lots of cards, yeah. a good and uh, like looks like a nicely laid out adventure book. Yeah, it's it's a lovely, very straightforward. lovely DM screen, and uh, and some digital sort of additions, some some unseen wisps of, yeah. of digital ephemera to add to the whole thing. And, and the, 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 okay, the, the little extra sting of the fact that it's set in the same town as the original starter box, so uh, an aspiring DM could combine them both and make yeah. a very grand adventure for their players if they wanted. And potentially run them all the way up to level eleven. Yeah, you say. absolutely. That's a that's a lot of gaming. Yeah, for uh, for that kind of money. Mm. All right. Well, uh, thanks again. It's great to see you on oh, again. As always. And I'm sure we'll we'll have you back soon. We have more bracket fight stuff coming up. So I, 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 have <laughs> I don't know to, how you're def- feeling about that. I have to defend. I think I'll have to step in to to defend D and D five before it gets to chop uh, because the, the brackets it's, are getting tougher. Yeah. All, all of those D&D editions have a, a target on their back yeah. for somebody. <laughs> so <laughs> well, we'll see how that goes. Anyways, uh, we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, and thank you for running us through the... Wait a second. Better get it, get the right name. Uh, the Essentials D&D Kit. D&D Essentials Kit. All right. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Well, there you go. Who said you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Okay, well, like I said at the top of the show, sometimes a custom piece out of the best box might only be vaguely related to the hobby. I grabbed Scar, Shane, uh, co-host and uh, and cohort. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Co-conspirator on many an episode this last year. And I asked him, I I wanted to pick his brain about something I've been curious about for a while, which is another hobby of his, uh, to do with, uh, let me get this straight, mobile suit Gundam models, or Gunpla, as it's known to those on the inside of the tent. So you might be saying to yourself, Savage, what do plastic robots have to do with gaming? And I'll be perfectly honest, not very much, but... I think it's useful to be informed about this and that, random topics, just in case you ever find yourself stuck at a dinner party or a cocktail party, um, short of a a little tidbit to offer the group. Or maybe you could use this as flavor for an NPC or an incidental detail in a game of your own. Anyway, I sat down with Scar and he filled me in on something that I knew nothing about but was only too happy to listen to him go on for a while on. So, hopefully, you're in the same frame of mind, and we will roll right into it. Scar! Scar, I've got a question. I need answers. Yeah, I need 
I've got a question I need to answer. I need to know everything I could possibly need to know about gunpla. Okay. Well, first off, the term gunpla is short for Gundam Plamo, and the the name the word Plamo is short for plastic model. Uh, we we do not know why the Japanese need to shorten every word like this, but it is apparently a, apparently a thing. They're, they're very so, brief people. <laughs> we need to get straight to it. No time for, for faffing around. So, a, a, a Gundam plastic model. Now, what's a Gundam? Well, I could go into the 41-year history of uh, one of anime's greatest franchises, uh, the epitome of the giant robot genre. Uh, but there are other podcasts you can go through that. I particularly recommend uh, Mobile Suit Breakdown. Uh, they're, they're doing a uh, very informative episode by episode breakdown of the uh, the main series. So um, you know, props to them. But In essence, it's a giant robot, isn't it? Yes, and yeah. it was the first series to really the uh, like before this. You know, you know, every giant robot series would have well, the ones that got the right connections would always have the right merchandise. But it was these big chunky. Uh, plastic behemoth with you know spring-loaded fists and uh, various bright bobbly add-ons. I believe they were brought over to America as Shogun warriors. Um, but Gundam was the one that introduced the concept of the build it yourself plastic model kit that you would uh, cut the pieces off the plastic one or is build up, and you would get a more show accurate model than the big bloated uh, safe for seven year olds uh, mon- uh, things that most merchandising deals would do and this this has grown into basically the second part of the uh, Gundam franchise and possibly the largest part is that right. uh, Like, there's always going to be like you know, the ads on television and the sales of DVDs and Blu-rays and such. But really, most of the money in the Gundam franchise has been from selling these model kits. Now, they still sell normal toys and all kinds of other merchandise, but a huge amount of it is... But the enthusiasts the- are going to gravitate towards getting a yeah. Gundam kit, a Gunpla. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's Gundam is a brand name, right? It's not a generic... Uh, well, the Gundam multiverse. It is in you know America and uh, Japan. Uh, it's a little okay. bit wibblier in Korea, where apparently they had the Xerox problem. Uh, right. But... Okay. Uh, and Bandai are the the main distributors of, of yes. Gundam kits. So at least now, if I understand it correctly, they're the uh, okay. They're model kits, but there's a very strict kind of ranking or grading system that's yeah. attached to this. Right. Talk uh, to I me believe... about that for a little bit. Well, most of what you're going to get is uh, high grades because, of course, the most generic thing should be the high grade one. Um, uh, <laughs> high grades are... So we're starting at a high bar and just working our way up from there, yeah, right? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. That's exactly what the thing is. So high grades are most of uh, the, the model kits. They come in a little... It's actually much smaller than the shoe bo- uh, shoebox size, but like about as wide as a... No, it's actually a bit smaller. So, yeah, but... Yeah, you're going to get about a... They're, what, about a 1 to 100 scale, 1 to 144, four, something like that? I believe 1 to 144. Four. Which, uh, if, for those of you playing along at home, brings you in at about the 15 to 18 centimeter yeah. mark. Okay, so yeah. about the same height as uh, an, a G.I. Joe, a He-Man? A little bigger, but yeah, around that bigger. kind of thing. Okay. Um, yeah, they're, they're fully posable at the scale. They tend to come with the basic accessories um, the emphasis on for HGs is generally on buildability so you'll us- usually get one done in like a few hours of work maybe three four hours two evenings and this is where you'd aim to start if you were if you decided to throw yourself into the well I believe there are like gunpla. there are junior grade or uh you know, fun grade versions, but they rarely make it out of Japan. Uh, you know, the enthusiasts are generally, or they're big boys. They don't, they don't do the baby. We don't need baby dam. We need gun dam. God damn. Yes. Uh, exactly. Right. So what's after high grade? Uh, then you generally, 
there's two ways you can go. You can go up in size, you can go up in complexity. If you go up in size, you're going to master grade. And this is where some of the, the this is where the larger kits go. Um, okay. They tend to be, you know, pretty solid. They have more detail because, you know, they're larger. They are a significant size increase. That's the 1 to 100 one. So uh, they're, they're, they're noticeably larger. Right. Uh, they'll come up to close to a foot in height. Right, so 20 centimeters to a foot. They're, yeah. And they're usually 1 to 100. Yeah. If, if, my, if my very rapid research has, yeah. has taught me anything. And the there's other direction... A few, there's going to be a few that, you know, for the larger... The mobile yeah. armors, which are the, like the, the final boss um, uh, suits, will I think they may fudge the scaling on that, but generally okay. that's where you're going to go. sit in that range. And you, may, you can go more detailed or bigger. So if you go. Uh, the more detailed one are real grades. They will right. be the uh, same size as a high grade, but, uh, you know, substantially more complicated, more detailing, a little harder to put together. I haven't really right. tried uh, real grades myself, but that's mainly due to supply and, you know, the real grades that are available not being super interesting to me. Um, so, and there's... Sets, uh, yeah, go on. There's, there's also, I believe there is the... <laughs> the final tier is the perfect grade, which right. is the size of a master grade, but the the super noodly um, details of a real grade. This is the one where you'll get, like openable panels that show the pneumatics inside and all kinds of internal detail and little hatches and uh, really a fully built out um, movable frame instead of just like you, you wouldn't be building like for like a master grade or uh, a, a high grade you would probably just be basically just building the arms as sort of a box but right. with like a perfect grade, you'll be building what's called the movable frame, which is basically the skeleton of the suit, and then clipping all the outer armor onto that. So, so if, if you can see a, an armor shoulder panel blown off in the show and see all the articulation underneath, you can find that on your perfect grade. Or, your or, or if grade. not, so you'll find some madman in, in Japan or Korea has uh, built that exact scene uh, and probably put <laughs> LEDs in the plastic somehow to represent the battle damage. Um, wow. Do you need to paint them? You do not need to paint them. But uh, I believe to really paint... Like, they come in the show accurate colours out of the box, but they are paintable if you're willing to, you know, just rough the uh, shiny edges with... You can sort of just do some light sandpapering on them and they should be able to take paint without much problem. There's also a... A secondary market in uh, extra decals, add-on parts, um, uh, special stands to pose them, and uh, Gundam markers, which are apparently a special kind of marker used for uh, panel lining. Uh, right, a kind of fine line, very thin felt nib. Yeah. Funny, because I've seen that come over into... Kind of the Warhammer and, and Warhammer 40k model painting guys, the I've, short I've cutting. Tr- I've never really tried panel lining my my suits. Like it seems like steady it, hands it, required. Yeah, steady hands. Uh, you know, reach. Uh, always have um, some uh, some cleanup fluid within reach. You know, but I can certainly see the effect if you're going for. You know, super high detail stuff. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of thing. This is full um, market and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so they're model plastic kits. They're they're snapped together. They uh, don't require yeah. painting, but they do require assembly. They are yeah. very accurate to the. So you've talked a lot about detail. What sort of details are we talking about? Are we talking about internal? Well, internal workings you've mentioned, and then markings show accurate stuff. Like, mm-hmm. what else is there? Any movable parts or any kind of bits and pieces that... Oh, they should be relatively poseable. Uh, depends on the exact line. Like, my most poseable one is my Master Grade God Gundam, which is from the Kung Fu fighting show G Gundam. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it is extremely poseable. Um, others are... 
Others are a bit stiffer. They're going for the military uh, hardware aesthetic, so they tend to be chunkier and less about doing basically flip kicks and more about holding <laughs> their guns dramatically. Gotcha. So, uh, you've got this this mobile gun of suit you've, you've put together. Um, you've, you're looking at your shelf space. You're considering how much to splurge. What does a gun plaque kit cost? Um, the smaller HGs will generally be in the 20 to 30 range, sometimes going up to 40 if it's a matter of availability. Um, a master grade will set you about 50 to 60. Uh, I believe a real grade would be about the, um, uh, the middle, so around 40 to 50. Yeah. Uh, and like perfect grades are where you're getting into the like 90 to 100 region. And they can go higher if you're going for, like, the high-end metallic finish products or the super large ones. Uh, or if you're going for web exclusives, this is where they really gouge the uh, the elite fans. Is they'll, they'll bring <laughs> okay. out this, you know, this mobile suit that was only in five seconds of the uh, show and everyone was clamoring for for ten years and... Uh, they'll bring it out, but it'll be like six hundred dollars on uh, a, a Bandai exclusive website, and you need to like pay someone in Japan to buy it for you, and then ship it to you. So you can go high, but for a starting grade, yeah, you can get them twenty euros pop, twenty thirty, uh, and so just to get started. That's a pre- pretty easy, uh, easy price point to get in on it and see if it's for you. Yeah. I I found somewhere in uh, during my reading there was mention of something. Like a Kavar or a there's a, a designer who redesigned a number of them. Is that? Is oh that yeah, uh, that is oh the the, the Katoki version. Uh, right. Yes. So the thing is, they're very good at repackaging the same design with a different artist uh, redesigning it. So uh, they'll take a whole bunch of old designs and they'll give them to someone new, like Mister Hajime Katoki, and he will redesign them to his more leg centric uh, design philosophies. <laughs> and He's a leg man. Get, yeah, you'll get them uh, the special uh, metallic finish versions or transparent versions. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, you, you'll just keep getting variations on different suits. You know, this one has a new add on booster pack and, and such. So, right. so they update very. Well known models all the time and put out. Yeah. New variations. There's a generally a, a turnover. Like, mm. my brother got me some really, really old models that have been sitting at home uh, up and down the golf for me. Uh, I've been afraid to actually open and start going to them because I'm afraid that this is before the modern innovations and these are the ones who will probably actually need like glue and, <laughs> and right. uh, airfix um, care and such. Still, nothing, nothing that a that a master gunpla assembler technician like yourself has, hasn't encountered before. <laughs> okay, well, I guess the last question to ask is probably one our, our listeners are asking: Why the hell are we talking about this? And the answer to that is: I just decided this is something I uh, I kind of developed a vague interest in all of a sudden and wanted to pick someone's brain on because <laughs> this, you know, and and wh- who better than uh, than the indomitable Scar? Um, I I'm, I have to admit I'm kind of curious. I yeah. uh, I and do like if, making models. Yeah, if you're curious about uh, making them, you can uh, head to the north end of Capel Street in Dublin, and you'll find there uh, the current uh, main uh, Irish supplier, uh, which is Coffee and Gundam, uh, a offshoot of the uh, Dublin City Comics franchise. Oh, well, they're a specialist uh, store just for Gundam, are there? Or well, Gundam, Gundam and some pretty decent coffee and uh, nice. um, cookies. I had some <laughs> of their. I think it was was it? No, it was like uh, they 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 made some. They had their special, uh, you know, Mars bar cookie, cookies and such. They're really Works. good. I would recommend if you're popping in to purchase some plastic. I would also uh, pick up some beverages and snacks. <sighs> Uh, well, that, other that, than lo- that, that localizes this nicely. Uh, <laughs> well, it also occurs to me that the, the the right kind of size to put into a, some sort of sci-fi game, if you need a, an imposing 
warrior robot model for uh, yeah. for a tabletop game. Is there? I mean, they're they're not to be sort of tossed around and played with. But is there any sort of battle suit Gundam tabletop battle game that would use these? Um, there have been. I believe there's been some in Japan. I believe there's all, there's been you know you see fan roles all over the place, but I do believe there has been at least one official Gundam war game, but it's for it was for those um, small kid grade uh, kits. Right. Hmm. Uh, and I believe there is actually a Gundam RPG in Japan based on Mechton Seta. So. Uh-huh. But it has been promised to be translated to English for about twenty years now, and does not appear to be on the horizon. Any day now, any day now, if we can get things like a, a Dune movie and a Foundation series, yeah, that's then a fair point. Gun plans it. I'm sure it's it's on the horizon. Okay, well, listen. Thank you, Scar, for filling me in on something I knew absolutely nothing about uh, twenty minutes ago. So with that, I'm, uh, I'll say goodbye, and I'll talk to you later. Take care. You'll see the tears of time. So there you have it. Who knew there was so much to know about the various gradings of robot model kits? I have to admit, before I sat down with Scar, I had absolutely no idea how, what I was going to learn about Gunpla, but it's um, kind of endearing, isn't it? It's, it's uh, nice to see people put all that care and craft into their hobby. Attention to detail really kind of makes you think about our own hobby and how uh, our GMs spend all this time on making stories around our characters, bringing us new and exciting worlds. How when we hit the tabletop player war game, someone has lovingly painted up their army or crafted terrain suitable for the engagement. When we sit down play a CCG, uh, each card carefully sleeved, lists poured over again and again, craft and care. It's what hobbies are about, pouring attention and love into something that makes us happy. So I think there's, you know, a touchstone there for us gamers, model makers, those who want to foster new talent, new players, and new GMs. Anyway, that's another Bits Box. I've been Savage, your host. If you'd uh, care to jump on a microphone and record a piece like this, please visit our Discord and get in touch. You'll find links in the show notes. Come and find us on social media. And be sure to share this episode and any others you like with your friends. Spread the hobby, spread a little cheer, and look after each other. But for now, this party's over. Thank you for listening to The Adventuring Party. If you'd like to leave us a voicemail, you can head on over to SpeakPipe and uh, drop us a line. Or you can join us on our Discord server, where we keep the party going after hours. Uh, Otherwise, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, or Twitter, or or you can email the hosts at party at theadventuringparty.net. The Adventuring Party is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike Version 3 license. But you probably knew that already. We hope you enjoyed the episode, and look forward to seeing you back here next week. Goodbye.